Well, it's a special episode today because we have a special guest, Jeremy Slate, here on the show. Now, Jeremy is an entrepreneur. He's a media expert, an author, and CEO and founder of Command Your Brand, which is a public relations agency. Before that, he's actually started other podcasts too and was named top influencer by Forbes and a top millennial influencer by BuzzFeed. Today, we're going to actually be talking about how Jeremy and Command Your Brand grew by 71% in a down economy and how to apply the same principles. Now, just a quick note that you should be able to apply some of these strategies and tactics that we do discuss today, but you've got to make a few tweaks so that it's a bit more tailored towards your startup so that you can experiment with some of the ideas and drive growth. So let's actually get into it. Um, Jeremy, thank you for coming onto the show, right? It's great to have you here. Um, <laughs> I mean, before we get onto how you got Command Your Brand to such heights, like, let's hear a bit about you, right? I want the audience to understand what you've done because you've done some, like when I was looking you up, you've, had a, you've done quite a bit, right? A few different things, selling on Amazon, selling insurance, yeah. that sort of thing. Well, I, I've, for people that, that, you know, kind of don't know the back end here, I had some like major technical problems before, like we got started here with my like ethernet dongle and things weren't working. <laughs> and I got to say, man, I don't know if you have this written out or you did that from memory. Like you nailed the same intro twice. So, <laughs> so very well done. On you. <laughs> I have like loose, I have like loose notes. I think I've learned to like have bullet points, but then that's it. Right. Like yeah. I just, everything else is based off of what I've actually read and stuff. So. Hopefully that's a good thing. Well, I was like, I, I was like, damn, man, you just nailed it. Well, it's interesting because I've done so many different things. Like I've, I've, you know, it's, it's you and I were kind of talking a little bit before we got going here, and I was like, I'm almost 35 and I don't look like definitely it, which is kind of wild. And I, I've, I've done a lot of living in that period of time. Like my master's is in ancient history, which is not a very applicable skill. I studied uh, propaganda in the Roman Empire and how the, you know, the the Roman Emperor used that to convince people of his divinity. Right. And not a very applicable skill in the, the world of getting a job. It's fun for watching the news, but other than that, it's not very useful. So I, I got out in 2011 in what was a rough economy, which is funny because I think inflation's like way worse yeah. now. But you, you look at that, and I was overqualified for a lot of jobs and underqualified for a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. So nobody would hire me for anything. So I actually came out and ended up working for um, a, a house painter during the day, and it was like old school. So everything was like super by hand, super hard work. Mm -hmm. And at night, I was managing the gym. So I was working like 16, 17 hours a day. And from there, I actually ended up teaching at a private school because you don't need like any schooling or training or anything like that. They just hope you have a college degree right. and that's about it. So they had me for lunch, man. So I, I, I did that and I, I was not very happy doing it because, you know, once again, I look young. So like I looked like I was the sophomore that I was teaching. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it just didn't really go so well. And then in 2012, my mom ended up having a really bad stroke. And it made me look at a lot of the different things I was doing. So then from that point, man, I, I tried just about anything. Um, I did network marketing and alienated a whole bunch of friends. I uh, you know, sold life insurance. I bought products in China. We actually went to China in, in 2014 and we're like, you know, having meetings and sourcing products and things like that. Came back and uh, I left my promo code to get my product for a dollar on my Amazon listing for FBA yeah. and lost everything I had in stock and like, 20 minutes and that was the end of my business. So like I tried all these things that didn't really go so well and I really just did podcasting as a hobby and it it took off man and it's it's kind of led me to a lot of what I'm doing today. Would you say that that actually what do you mention the the keyword hobby right? Would you say that that was a key player in like things going successfully because yes. I hear a lot about that right? Like it, I don't know what your motivations were. Maybe we can talk a bit about that like what the motivations yeah. were before you started the podcast. Well well, because here's the thing. I, I find that like some of the worst advice out there, like I've, I've, I've worked on a couple different viewpoints on this. Like everybody says, you know, burn the boats and jump in. And, and here's the thing, man. When you do that, you make some really bad decisions. And all the decisions I was making about was like eating this week, paying my credit card bill, whatever that was. It wasn't about like growing this business or, you know, how am I going to get to a point where I can hire? It was like very hand to mouth. Right. So from there, I actually ended up working at a friend's marketing firm just and that was what was paying the bills it was allowing me to do a lot of things i was self-taught in uh writing css and html5 so i was able to like code a lot of pages and stuff like that and i started a podcast re literally just as a hobby because i was interested in still doing something i didn't know what that something was but i wanted to still get out there and 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 figure out how to you know kind of create something for myself and at that point in time i'd been a podcast listener since 2007 
um, I had a college professor that had introduced me to the whole idea of podcasting. I was, I, my first podcast was called the no agenda show. I still listen to it to this right. day. Um, they make, they make fun of the news twice a week. It's great. And that was, I had been a listener and it had been something I enjoyed and I just literally started as a hobby, but I find that, you know, the burn the boats mentality, it doesn't work for everybody. And it didn't work for me, frankly, because I made some bad decisions. I started something I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And once I started to make more money in that than what I was doing in my career, that's when you take a look at, well, what are you going to do with right. this? But so for me, it was more or less I needed a creative outlet. That creative outlet got interesting to other people. And that's where the business came from. Yeah, I think that's pretty interesting because there are a lot of people that, again, like, I think it's I think it's pretty cool how you use the words burn the boat because that's exactly what people are led to believe that they should do. You know where that comes from, by the way? Where? It comes from um, it comes from the legend of the Trojan War, and um, they wanted to burn the boats because they were going to conquer Troy. So if they didn't have any boats, they wouldn't go back to their home country. Ah, okay, that's fairly interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I would never have thought that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 a thing that's actually pushed on people, right? So um, that sort of way of starting something or going into something. So it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. But was so you mentioned you started podcast, but was that command your brand or was that the ones beforehand? So I, I had one in uh, 2014 called Rock Your Life. Okay. And at that point in time, it was just something I was doing as an extra outlet to make all these things that weren't succeeding succeed. It was more of this like personal development, blah, 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 blah. And nobody listened to it. It was just horrible. Like I didn't have a mic. It was just me talking to my like iBook G4. So it was like horrible sound, like no quality yeah. content whatsoever. So then in 2015, November of that year, I started the Create Your Own Life show. Um, which is now close to a thousand episodes, and I've gotten to talk to a lot of incredible people. Um, Command your brand, um, the business came out of that of people saying like, "Hey, can you help me with the podcast world?" Mm -hmm. And then you know later on, we actually started the Command Your Brand podcast. But it was really create your own life that came first. People started asking for help. And the first version of that help, frankly, was a done for you podcast business. Right. And we found out that a lot of our biz, our, a lot of our clients were CEOs and founders. And they don't have time to really have a podcast and do all this other stuff. They just wanted to go on shows. So that's literally how we started focusing on that was people ask for that. And later on, we created uh, the Command Your Own Podcast. We kind of realized we've been in this space a long time. We don't have our own show. That's kind of weird. Yeah, I, I guess, well, could you sort of paint a picture behind what it looks like now, Command Your Brand, like team size or, or company size? Yeah. Cause you, you grew by 71%, but it was that in terms of headcount? Was that in terms of like revenue? Like... That was in terms of revenue, yeah. um, over year revenue. So um, we did also grow in terms of like, we doubled in size in terms of employees. Mm -hmm. Like um, we have a, a team of 18, um, you know, half are US based, half are, half are uh, internationally based. And um, the, the big thing that we took a look at when the, when the pandemic happened is I think a lot of people were clamping down and they were saying, I'm not gonna spend, you know, like, I don't know when, where my next dollar is coming from. And the thing we took a look at is, we're virtual and we've always been virtual. Yeah. Right? Like we, we've always been a, a distributed workforce. So we said, well, what can I do right now? And I can invest in people because a lot of people are getting laid off from their jobs. A lot of people are looking for work. So I actually went out and found the best people because they were available. And that was the biggest thing to growth because the way to grow your bottom line, man, frankly, is to have more people to do it, which is huge. But at the same time, we focused a lot on building processes. And Building a process when you're a virtual company is much different than building a, comp a process when you're an in-office business. Yeah. So we had to take a look at, like, how can we train people? And one of the biggest things is we do a lot of screencast recordings and checklists um, because it's vital. Like, if you ever try to write out a step-by-step -step process of something that you're doing on screen, it's like 5,000 steps for a 10-minute video. But when you can show somebody narrated with, um, you know, with highlighted clicks and things like that, you could do some really great training. So we really focused on building better company training, hiring more people. Um, and that, that was really, really vital to our growth. And at the same time, we were riding the wave of people having all these events canceled and things like that. So we were in the right place at the right time, but willing to take advantage of it. And we, we grew our revenue substantially um, in... in uh, in 2021 and uh we didn't hit seven figures but we got darn close so uh you know we did very well that year yeah. but it, it, i think it's incredible to to even hear the fact that you said you can hit seven figures right you're on that trajectory and like you mentioned yeah. about processes it's something i'm actually i'm actually trying to get in the in the swing of things I'm doing it's probably on my board here uh the trusty like whiteboard <laughs> things to do but it's document process is just reminding myself so every time i'm either optimizing a campaign whether it's for marketing or or we're delivering a client project and we're trying to build a strategy and then leverage some of the tactics right 
um we are always trying to like optimize each the performance of each of these campaigns and whatever tactical work we're yeah. doing so what's great is i think before i was in the position of i've got to do it all and i've got to continuously do it all and then i was it was mm-hmm. almost like cradling a baby right like sort of i don't want to let go i don't <laughs> want to let go but now i'm trying to get into the swing of things of like sort of handing that off right and and getting the team to work in the same way i had done but also ask for their expertise because it's hard for me to actually understand everything and become a specialist at everything but be the expert every day right and learn about the in, the mm-hmm. biggest industry trends in that area whereas these guys like if we collectively work on that towards that goal and we collectively document those processes after it's going to be so robust that you can easily do it and we're we're purely virtual as well, uh, virtual as well that's why it works so well with mm-hmm. our clients um so i totally get that but what i well there's a couple of things i want to add to that if i yeah, can yeah, that's a, that, those are some really great points you made there um like the first being like you know i i take issue with gary v on the whole like don't do you know shit you don't want to do when you're building a business, you, you kind of have to. Like, if, if you want to build a big business, you kind of have to. Because here's the thing you have to take a look at. There's, I'm not an expert at everything, man. Um, but I know how to do enough. Because a lot of business owners, I think, they don't understand certain areas of their business. They say, well, I'm just going to find somebody to do it. And here's the problem. You could become the adverse effect of that, right? If something's going wrong, like, you know, I'm not a Google Ads expert. Mm-hmm. But I know well enough about Google Ads that when they were bugged, I knew there was something wrong with the agency we were working with, and I found somebody else to handle my problem. But if you get in a situation like that, you can keep kind of hammering the wrong nail. So I think that's really, really important is to have enough understanding of the different areas of your company is one part of it. But the other part about it as well is you're talking about like having people in different positions in your company. Right. I think one area a lot of people are weak is when they give somebody else a job, there's no job description. There's no what does this person do. There's no processes this person does. They just, okay, I'm going to hire a salesperson to go sell. Okay, go sell. Wait, why can't you sell? What's happening? Like a lot of times they try to have somebody inhabit a job that's not there. And it's important to put it there. And I do like that you you, you mentioned um, people adding to that process. Now, I'm still maniacal about if you want to change my process, you got to write up for me and it's something I can approve or disapprove why it's better. Yeah. Because I think, too, you can have people kind of going wild with changing things in your company. It's going to change the, the valuable final product you're getting. Yeah, it's a quality gate. It's a quality gate, right? So yeah. that, I think that's there's nothing wrong with that completely. Because if, you, if, you, if a team member was supposed to do that, so like, for example, we have some, I've just sort of outsourced this, this bit of like PPC, right? So let's say, um, but but I sit at the strategic level of things because I understand it and I have to drive, camp- I probably have to like lay the foundations of why we're doing this, right? For the client. And so they'll ask me like, why don't we do this? But I'll be like, we could, and I understand exactly what you're doing, but unfortunately because of the position this company's in and strategically it would have made sense, we should probably put that on the side, right? Right for now and then focus on these areas. But there's nothing wrong with, them saying something it actually does have an impact on what we're strategically trying to do and then me saying okay let's test it out right there's not a problem and if something goes well let's document the process but you've got to write it up and do it yourself and then we'll in it's almost like a let's have like our infrastructure we're building infrastructure we've set it in place and then we're testing something only when that's been approved and we're ready to scale or document it that's when we move it into the infrastructure it's not just added in directly otherwise you're creating a messy infrastructure you're probably going to undo a lot of the things you've done well and you're still the brains of the business that way as well and i think that's when you look at a founder or you look at somebody who's an executive in a company like they're still kind of holding the reins and making sure that like everybody's playing their music in the right way, yeah. right? Because there's experts, but there's also like, you know, you started this company because you have a vision for it. So you know where you want it to go and you need to control that vision. And I think that's really vital with what you just said there. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think based on what you were talking about before as well, I think what would be great to hear, Jeremy, is the, the initial mm-hmm. position you are in, right? So like when yeah. you started out with Command Your Brand, did you have a huge budget? Did you have investors? Like how did you even begin to think about tackling traction? Like how do you get traction, yeah. right? So so here's the interesting part about it. So Command Your Brand is actually, as I mentioned, it's kind of like the third version of what we yeah. do. We had Slate Media Productions where we were doing you know podcasts and things for people. And, and I just reached out to people I knew told them I could do this for them, told them it was going to cost them 20000 a month. And like, great, I'll give you 1000 So like, I didn't make very much money early on. And then from there, we actually ended up hooking up with another entrepreneur. 
and starting um, it was called Get Featured Media, which does exactly what Command Your Brand does now. Okay. And um, what we ran into at that point is I was more of the operations person. Um, the the co-founder was more of the sales person. Mm-hmm. And we kind of ran into this this scaling issue because I could only do so much. He had a different vision for the company, wanted to turn it into an app. So we, we did multiple six figures in our first six months and kind of went from there and went our separate ways. So the thing I ran into when I started Command Your Brand is I retained all the employees from the first company. So I had staff. Right. I had to now figure out how to pay them, but I didn't have any sales. And we had a, a, a bit of a legal situation that we had to figure, how do we end this up and I still pay everybody? Yeah. So not only did we start this company like um, at Square One, we kind of started it below Square One, right? Because people associated me with this other brand. Um, I had people I had to pay for and things like that. So I actually was taking side work initially to pay people's paychecks because I didn't want to lose them. And that was really vital. Yeah. So from there, it was really getting clear on what the new branding was, which is what Command Your Brand became. And then it was reaching out tactically to every single person I knew that either knew somebody that could use our service or could use the service themselves. And so we had no funding. We had no nothing. It was we kind of, you know, you know, ate what we killed in a lot of ways. So you had to, to really be willing to go out there and create the business and create the business. As I said, I was already behind the eight ball. Yeah. We still retained clients in the previous company that had already paid in full. The money was gone and we had to make this thing work, man. So it was literally how often can I get on the phone? How quick can I make things work? And then we went from there and our big focus became cold emailing. Um, cold emailing, I think, was one of the earliest ways we could get leads and get people on the phone. And uh, we used a service called D7 Lead Finder. And what you can actually do is put in different cities and different key terms, and you can create lists of people for different, um, you know, different like careers or businesses or whatever right. within that. Yeah. And we started reaching out to those people that way. And that was initially how we got enough started to start investing in Google Ads. Um, and Google Ads has been one of our biggest single drivers in, in business growth. Um, I found Facebook ads, frankly, to be pretty worthless for us because it's it's not really driven by somebody that's intent on looking for the service, whereas it's just like, hey, I know you're scrolling, but here's my business. Um, when on, when Google, it's like, okay, I'm looking to solve this problem. It's intent-based, and because of that, we're getting people that are actually looking for the service. So for us, we've continued to, to put money into Google ads, and, and we've had really good payoff from that. Yeah, I, I always talk about when we're setting up a marketing strategy, You know, I, I like the fact that you started, right? So first off, you had a reset. But also, you found that strate- the strategic element behind, like how you should be going after these audiences, right? That's the strategy, right? Going after what audiences and why. You found the why and the type of audiences that's going to work for you, right? So that's when you started to reach out to them. So first came strategy and research, then your tactics was like sort of the way to amplify that, right? Yeah. Which is which is was incredible because you talked about intent as well. And I think I say to a lot, so I say to a lot of uh, startup founders as well that we work with um, that, or even just people that we have conversations with that when you're actually using PPC, you can also use it as a testing mechanism, right? So, yes. so what, right? That you haven't gone around and you probably haven't heard whether there's a great fit for your product in the market. So there's no product market fit, right? You can still use PPC as a stream to understand whether there is a fit because if you're getting hits, if you're getting conversations through that, then you know that this is actually a changing medium, right? For your business, right? People actually are mm-hmm. looking for things online related to your product and are able to get in contact with you. So it's not, it's not an issue, which is great. And I'm, I'm glad that you actually mentioned the idea behind cold email. Cause at the very beginning, you know, you have to go out there and sort of build the network, right? And do the, like, well, and you can only make as much as you're willing to work. And when you don't have a lot of money in the beginning, man, you do what doesn't cost you much. Yeah, <laughs> no, I've, so, so, but I think that's great. Right? Like, cause anyone could have said, and I think this brings me to the next point is the whole PR versus marketing versus sales, mm-hmm. right? And the right combination to mm-hmm. scale your company, right? You mentioned you, you tried cold emails and that was working for you. You got those meet, initial set of meetings, right? So you kept going with it. And then once you had that sort of the cash flow and, and revenue coming in, you then were able yep. to use the marketing expenditure to put it, push money into like PPC ads, which is great. You found that worked, right? Um, were there any ones that you thought failed, like any failed tactics that you were just like, Hey, we just need to switch this off and then just keep with these two, for example. Um, Hmm. I don't know. I I find like cold emailing is a great early strategy, but it's not a great one to do over time because you have to worry about like, you know, continually like getting a new domain and warming them up and all that kind of stuff as well. And you have to worry about blacklisting and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, 
it's a good way to get started, but it's not something to, you know, consistently do well. So I, I would take a look at that and I would say like it was something good in the beginning, but it's just not as effective now because you have to quickly change out domains and things like that. Um, we didn't have a ton of success um, like marketing on LinkedIn by because I think there's a lot of different ways you can market on LinkedIn. But one of the things that um, there was a lot of gurus promoting like two or three years ago was going into groups, messaging people in groups and, and telling about what you do. The problem is like, number one, they don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, like LinkedIn is kind of inboxes are messy already. So you're just kind of adding yourself into that. And then from there, like you may not even know if there's a need or not. You're kind of disturbing them. So like we found that to not really be a great thing that we got some sales and some growth from mm -hmm. it, but it wasn't really something long term if you want to have like a, a healthy account, right? Because you start to get strikes against your account and things like that. Um, so I found like LinkedIn outreach to not be great. So for me, it was uh, we really focused on Google ads. But at the same time, the thing we've always been doing, because I think PR always comes first, is we've always been doing PR in some way, shape or form. Um, we write a release every time something new happens and we figure out how to make it newsworthy, right? Because not everything you do is newsworthy. Like entrepreneur starts a new business is not interesting because there's 50 more this week. They're going to do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's on the low end. But you have to find out something unique about what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like um, veteran owned business or, you know, something unique and interesting about what you're doing. Then people care. So we've always consistently doing PR, which is getting on other podcasts. It's getting releases out to what I like to call your small pond. Um, a lot of people seem to forget about this. They want to start with the ink and the Forbes and stuff like this. But you're a big fish in a small pond somewhere. If you're in a small town, if you're in a small organization, those things usually have publications that also publish to Google News. Um, because it's very interesting. Um, if you want to get an article that hits Google News, a lot of your small local newspapers, because they've been around for a while, um, are kind of grandfathered into appearing in Google News. Mm -hmm. And they have like a, such a low barrier to entry. Um, the less happens in your town, the more of a chance is you're going to get picked up. Like for me, I grew up in a small town that's five eighths of a mile in size. So if anything happened there, like if a cow farted, it was going to be in the news. <laughs> so basically, we wrote a press release, and I know that it printed. Every, it was a once a week paper. It ran on a Thursday, right? And I knew if I sent it to them by Tuesday, it would run on Thursday, and it would appear in Google News too. So now you're creating backlinks to your site, which is vital. You're creating buzz about yourself in the in the media. And I think when people think of releases, the release itself, sure, it can be a media piece, but it isn't the intention of a release. The intention of a release is to get other media to read it and be interested in you. So that's like how I've gotten on television. It's how I've gotten other interviews and things like that. But you really, like, we were doing all these other things, like cold emailing and Google ads, but we were always doing PR. Yeah. Because as you mentioned, the, the cycle is public relations, marketing, and sales. If you're not selling, you take a look at what's happening in marketing. If marketing's not converting, you take a look at what's happening in your public relations. Because if people don't know you, like you, and trust you, they can't go to that next step. So it's vital to have all three of those things in, and you can work it backwards and forwards, man. You start with PR and get known. Create, Use that PR to create marketing pieces and things to remarket, right? Because if you're really smart, you're going to figure out how your PR pieces can, can be hooked to a remarketing pixel so you can then hook that to your marketing. So there's a lot you can do if you're realizing that it's a cycle of public relations, marketing, and sales. Yeah, I think that's that fits into the whole narrative behind that sort of demand generation piece, right? So we know that you've got to generate demand. So I know one of the first places I'll look is where is demand high? So where is intent high? Well, Google ads, Bing ads, you know, places like search engine where people look for information those are places like you should actually be looking for intent. So that's fine to test with, right? But I do mention that, for example, even just spinning up, spinning up really valuable articles, not just as like, you know, there's a the fine line between SEO and just writing articles for the sake of it, but actually appearing like, <laughs> like, like years ago when people used to think SEO was putting words in white in your white background so that they uh, would show up in search. Yeah. <laughs> I remember people used to, it was keyword, it's keyword stuffing, right? So like they would, I, just, yes. I can't believe people used to spin up pages just to do that. And I was like, this is crazy. Um, and you would read them and you'd be like, dear God, this has no value to me. And then, and then Google kind of got smart after like Panda and some of the things after that of like, there has to be value to the content you're actually creating. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, I think that's important, right? So you mentioned coupling. So coupling PR with that whole SEO part, but not just going after what hits, also having some stream of content where whether it's podcast, whether it's video, whether it's um, blog. And by the way, you can do all three if you're smart about it and repurpose a bunch of your content, right? Yeah. So long it's valuable, right? Your audience will find it because you're, you're, you're covering the keywords naturally. 
um, you're speaking about actual topics, right, in a very human way. And right now, mm-hmm. I mean, we have a content problem, right? There's there's so much of it, right? And so that the how do we like even filter out some of the mess, like or some of the trash content? That's by actually mm-hmm. finding the ones that actually do speak to us. So. I think it's really good on the demand gen piece, like you mentioned with PR, because that's something that you should do. And I think just to, one more point onto that is it's like the Instagram, the whole the whole Instagram idea. I don't know, uh, you're probably familiar with this, but the whole influencer marketing strategy, right? Or And then tactically going and paying uh, influencers. People used to li- just look for the highest like follower, like the highest accounts with the highest followers and maybe the highest engagement. But that doesn't always work. What if you had a very niche? Because well, now account? they pay for in followers and they pay for engagement and everything else. So it's like now now you can't even find the value. It becomes very difficult. Exactly. But I- imagine if you could just find a smaller account that has a very niche audience, but you know the barrier to entry, like you mentioned, is a lot lower. And guess what? Mm-hmm. You have a very highly specialized or targeted audience. That's going to be way more valuable than the the five million that that you know maybe majority of them are kids, but you're trying to sell them like a five hundred dollar product, right? A software, right? You can't you can't do yeah. that. So no, I totally understand exactly where you get from, uh, where you come from, and I kind of I guess that the last point on that part was was there a specific north star metric, Jeremy, that you focused on? right at the very beginning was it just revenue um was it leads right was it like what was your north star metric to to ensure that this is going successfully it's revenue man because like it, it's like if well revenue and profitability right like, right because those are two things people don't think about you can be making revenue but if you're not profitable you're in trouble right like if you're paying staff more than you're bringing in right like we've always had a policy of Anything that um, you know, I'm paying somebody, I should be making double somewhere else to pay for it. Right, mm. so that's like really, really vital. So we've always we've always looked at profitability um, versus like um, income because if you don't have income, you can't do anything else. You can't market. You can't do a lot of these different things. So that's really what we were looking at because it shows you there's interest and it also shows you like that there's growth. So we've always looked at income and profitability. Those are two major things. We run a uh, a graph. So we run like. I look like a maniac. I run like 50 graphs on like everything in my business. I graph everything in my company. And the one major one we run is called cash versus bills. And uh, it's it's a, a graph that like crosses each other. And um, on one side is the amount of cash your company has. The other side is the amount of bills your company has. Right. And if you have more bills than cash, you're not profitable. So we run that on a weekly basis to kind of know where we're at. And I think that's really vital. So that for us, those have been kind of the things we've been looking at is profitability, cash first bills. Yeah, I think I, I focus on that. Well, I've actually, as of 2022, I sort of set up a like a financial performance like sheet or planner, should I say, right? And my, minus the accounts because you have to look at that. But what I did was I really wanted to see a snapshot of exactly what how much profit, right, was coming out of the business and not just revenue, right? I didn't, if most of it's going to be expenses then I'm not really being efficient. So I need to make sure that most of it is profit. And that's, that's, that's important. Well, there were, there was a company, I don't know if you saw this recently, I think it was fast.com. Was it, is that what it was called? It was a payment processor company. Mm-hmm. And, um, they had taken, I think in venture backing, they'd taken like a hundred and something million dollars. Um, and they churned out only $600,000 in profit last year. That's insane. And they actually just folded. Because they're just more venture money, more venture money, more venture money, make it work, but they were never profitable. Yeah. And I think that's why it's really tough in the startup world, man, is is there there's so many businesses like that eventually they could be hugely profitable, like an Amazon or something like that. Um, but so much money goes in and it could be lost. Like you have to be looking at profitability and, and, and value that profitability, frankly. Yeah. And I think I th- I think it's really important that you mentioned that because there are a ton of startups in the space, right? no matter what sector we're talking about, horizontal or vertical, you know, people, there's a lot of startups that want that growth, but it always comes down mm-hmm. to, well, first off, how much research have you done? Are you just like almost creating something and then just running with it? And second, I feel like people are now taking it because of there's so many startups. It's such a sprint for some of these people that they forget that if they just slow down and actually try to look at what pieces to put together first, and what foundation mm-hmm. infrastructure to build, um, they're more likely to like succeed, right? They don't have to fail. Yes. It doesn't. They don't have to fail. Yes. They can stop themselves. They can prevent themselves from failing. There, there's a Netflix series. I don't know if series. I don't know if you saw it. It's called The Dropout. 
or not Netflix, Hulu, sorry. Mm. It's about Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the company at all? Uh, no, but I have heard of it. So it was a blood testing company. They were supposed to be able to like test people with one drop of blood, mm. um, but their tech never actually worked. So they faked it, and they went like and they they got like I think like three hundred million dollars in in venture backing. Her personal like net worth went up to a billion dollars, and then eventually they figured out like because they had said, well, it'll work by the time we go to market, um, and it never actually worked. And she's actually going to prison now. So it's like it's kind of wild, man. Like you have to be able to prove your concept. You have to know what how profitable you are. Yeah, and you never need to say like, well, it will work when it has to work, man. Yeah. I think that's where we're in this sort of economy where I guess it's, a, I would say that like a, a user generated economy, right? So we're focused heavily on that word of mouth again, right? E word of mouth. Yes. Right? We're like, that's why podcasts are so popular. Exactly. Like I, I remember it was like quite a few years, um, 2015, probably even if it was just sports podcasts or just even listening to new comedians or whatever, right? Like the content was so it was so hard to get into it, but now it's just like every day, right? You find some time to listen to something. And I guess there's less reading now. I wanted to get into reading. I did. And then yeah. I find that it's just easier to listen to it. It's just much more. I do audiobooks as well. I'm like a yeah. huge consumer of that. I'm, I'm, I'm doing several every month. I just like, especially have, uh, having kids, I have a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old and uh, you know, my, my wife is my, my partner in the company and everything. So it's like at the same time, like I just don't have the amount of time I would like to have to do a lot of things I want to do. So it is, I am so tied to audio, whether it's, you know, listening to a podcast about the Yankees or whether it's listening to, I, I do a lot of autobiographies, listening to things like that. I'm always consuming, but it is user driven, like you're saying, which I, I can't tell you the last time I picked up a book. Yeah. And I always, I always talk about that as well. Like with part of growth strategies, one of, one of the things I always recommend is, can you look at the existing client base you have right now and can you move the needle by just focusing on them, right? So yep. either, whether that's to get more from them, but in, in exchange of obviously real value for them. And second, what if they love your product that much? What if they love you that much and you've built that relationship where they're okay with giving you that review or testimonial on an official site, like on a on a G2 crowd or a Capterra or whatever, or whatever we're looking at, even a, the podcast platforms, right? Which mm -hmm. is pretty interesting. Um, Oh, and, it's a well, and, and that's something supplement companies are actually excellent with, by the way. Yeah. Um, like a lot of companies do a, a poor job and like they always need new customers and customer acquisition is such an important thing. And it is like it's definitely important. But like supplement companies are excellent with building what's called share of customer. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You can come here to uh, to this company and we, we have creatine for you. We have protein for you. We have your branched chain amino acids. We actually have everything you need. And when you're looking at that, your your lifetime customer value is so much higher. Um, it's hard to just have a single frontline service. Like you need to have multiple things you can offer your customer. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, someone that done that, well, some a company that's successful about it recently is Huel, right? Huel and like you got My Protein, like those places. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, I think they're UK focused, but okay but it's still like my point is that they still follow the entire like principle behind a user generated you know like value driven community right and that's pretty like powerful in itself yeah like first form was the one i was thinking of uh, andy Frisella's company yeah and like you know they have supplements and then like it's so exciting that people go to events for it mm -hmm. and they have a diet with it and they do all these different things like they've created a culture around their product. Mm -hmm. And I think when you can do that and have people that are so into your product that they're telling other people about it and buying multiple versions of it, like that's, that's a, an amazing thing. Absolutely. Um, one thing I wanted to like, I think because we're talking about community, I think it's really important, right? Like how to hack your position as a trusted authority, as we say, or a thought leader in your space. Right? So when you start, people don't really know how you actually get the word out right? Uh, and position mm -hmm. yourself as someone to be taken seriously. Um, how do you, how would you recommend that startup should be doing that? Right. How did you guys do it? Right. I mean, aside, I know we talked a bit about PR, but I guess more so in a strategic sense. Well, it's, it. frankly, like I see a podcast as an excellent way of doing this. Um, and there's, there's a couple different ways you can do it because, um, that first, I always recommend people go on other shows first to get comfortable with being a guest, like because you want to understand what that's like. It can be a little stressful if you haven't been there. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like having my own podcast, I've gotten access to a lot of people that, frankly, I shouldn't be able to get access to. 
And uh, like I've interviewed the the former CAA director David Petraeus. I've interviewed um, you know Hall of Fame athletes and stuff like that. Right. And what what actually happens is there's this concept within the branding world called positioning. Um, there's an excellent book uh, by by Jack Trout and Al Rees. It's called uh, Positioning: The Battle for Your Mind. I think it was written in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, positioning is this idea of what you're seen as for or against, and you're grabbing something people are already familiar with. Um, so I, the, the example I hate the most, but it's the most simple because people get yeah. it, is companies that say we're the Uber of blank. Well, people know what Uber is, so they know you're like Uber. So you're grabbing something people are already familiar with in their minds, and you're actually taking some of that credibility. Mm -hmm. So podcasting is an excellent way, whether you're a guest or a host, to grab that positioning because you're interviewing people that are powerhouses in their own right within the niche you want to be in. So now they see you with, um, you know, celebrity A, well, now you've borrowed some credibility. Celebrity B, you've borrowed some credibility. And it's frankly what I've been able to do with the podcast. Like I've been able to build, I guess, in some ways, uh, you know, celebrity persona. Like don't tell my wife, she definitely doesn't think I'm a celebrity. <laughs> um, but like celebrity persona by a lot of the people I've interviewed when, you know, frankly, before having the podcast, I hadn't really accomplished much other than reading a lot of books. So it allows you to really get that, you know, proper positioning in your space by being continually seen with the right people in your space. It's much like, you know, influencer marketing, like you mentioned earlier, um, but taken in a way that's driven by long form content. Absolutely. So you can actually really hack your positioning by being continually seen with the right people. So that's why I see podcasting come into Yeah, I, I agree because I've used the same principles for Growth Vertical, right? It, this all started just because I was asked a few questions either through the website and had no pod podcast, no YouTube, no, like mm -hmm. no content marketing whatsoever. And that's in that way, just a website and maybe, um, a, a few links here and there, right. To a profile. And then I got like a, a couple of examples. I think it's from Instagram. That's when it started. And people started asking me, well, how do you get into this? How do you do this? And it was like repetition of those questions. So one day I was just like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make a video and I'm going to put it out. I'm going to, and I'm going to repurpose that and put it into a podcast, right? And we're going to, and we're going to put that out. And then next thing you know, there was more viewers. And I realized the questions, the, the questions started coming to me naturally, right? I didn't, there mm. were, there are new questions, but guess what? I can now take the question, really think about how I can apply my ex expertise to it and provide some, my two cents on the matter, and then amplify that message out rather than anything else. And I've also done the same thing. I invite marketers, startup founders, right? Um, any any founders, right? Overall, just onto the podcast because it sits within what people want to hear, right? They want to talk about how to market better, how to grow themselves, how to grow their businesses, even their career, right? No matter whether they're trying to start a business or even just do well in their marketing role. So it's been really cool. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that definitely have lifted things up is having a sh like a share of expertise that the exchange of value but live yes. on, on a podcast or through a talk right um when that goes along with what you with with you know like what you were talking about it's actually the other half of what yeah. i'm saying like podcast listeners are very educationally driven mm. so when you're creating the content like you're saying like these are the questions people had for you like you're becoming the answer to a lot of questions people have and you're putting it out there in a way that other people can get those same the same questions answered. So you're growing your authority by people knowing, well, you know, hey, I can come to Neil to get what I want answered answered. Yeah. And that's that's a huge difference, man. That's how you hack that position. I agree. Um so just a quick thing, just to like sort of end this part of it, right, is to growing in that down economy, right? Is there principles that you would stick by like stick to to grow in that down economy and that you could share with the audience out there. Cause there are a lot of startups that did start even during the COVID pandemic. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was very difficult for some people. Well, I, I think frankly, and this is one of the big things I, I talk about in my book on remarkable to extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things is when you're looking at adversity, you look for what is, you know, what is the thing I can get out of this, right? Because there's always something positive that can come out of something negative. You just got to be willing to find it, whereas most people are going to run the opposite direction. Right. So the first thing's a mindset, man, is you look at, okay, so, you know, this stinks. What can I get out of this? And there's so many businesses that were created out of that, right? Like, um, you know, I know people that like, saw the opportunity to create mask companies because people suddenly needed to buy masks because the world got a little crazy. So like you need to find out what is the opportunity and what I'm doing and, and where is kind of the benefit there because other people are not going to see it. So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is realizing what security comes from and security doesn't come from other people or the economy or whatever it is. It comes from your own ability to produce and do. And then the other thing as well is 
you know, how can I, number one, cut costs, which isn't something people are thinking with, mm-hmm. um, and how can I produce more and better while cutting costs? And and I, it, it's really just kind of the tried and true things you can do in every situation. It doesn't, it, it's it's not like a particular tactic that's going to, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's not like a particular tactic. Like, I agree. Oh, go out and hire an accountant or something yeah. like that. But it's certain ways you should be looking at the situation and you'll find the solutions. You know what I mean? Yeah. Every solution is not the same is what you're saying. And, and it's. It, it yes. all starts from people that want every aspect. solution to be the same. Yeah, though. yeah. I mean, I think it's because of the whole shortcut nature and almost time to market to be as short as possible, right? And they want to they want to drive as much. I don't know whether it's like a, we're in the culture of get rich quick, probably now, right? And I think I'm being dead serious, right? You hear a lot of stuff. No, right? but you're right. And this is the biggest thing I found when I first went into network marketing. Nobody ever wants to like join your like your thing or whatever they call it because they say, oh, is this one of those get rich quick schemes? I don't want one of those things. Then they sign up and they want it to be a get rich quick scheme. It's like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, man? <laughs> it's terrible. I mean, I, I think it's, it's insane because to me, there's a lot of people that sort of um, feed off of this, right? and almost use this very hungry nature or, or I guess hungry and trait, I should say, to, to drive sort of like money for themselves, right? So a lot of people did sort of pounced yep. on the idea and started doing this. And I don't know whether it's, I'm not going to say anything, but like it's, it's, it's like backbone or not. But, you know, there's a lot of people that pounce on that sort of opportunity. Let me just sell the dream to someone. And then, and you know, there was like a big rush and there still is this big rush. Yep. And even in the marketing community, where I always say, that there's marketers that have either done it. I'm not saying that you have to have a degree to be a marketer nor anything like that, but you may have some. You may overlook someone that's that's got a degree and that actually has done the grunt work to learn strategy principles and has run a bunch of tactics and has had some results failing as well as succeeding. Mm-hmm. And then you have the other one that says, "Oh, I'm a marketer and we have this small thing, but we're only doing Facebook ads and." We, yep. Yeah, you know, and they're trying to sell that sort of, we'll help you. But guess what? I'm going to go and outsource that to like 50 other people that say that they do well. And I'm going to see if this works and that's it. Like, I get it, right? They're trying to create a business, but I think it's driven more by money than it is by the outcome of anything like intrinsic. Well, to me in hiring or whether bringing on a service or whatever it may be, like in, in anything like that. I put way more value in somebody's experience and their statistics than what their degree is in. And this is coming from somebody that has a very yeah. advanced degree, yeah. right? Like I don't use it, but like I think that life experience and boots on the ground experience and being able to figure things out is so much more valuable than, you know, um, what you learned in a book. Somewhere. Oh, a hundred percent. Um, you know, if you learned how to build WordPress sites on your own, you're going to know some other things that you're not going to learn in a, in a, in a, in a class on how to do that. Um, you know, you could learn how to rebuild a retargeting ad because you're trying to solve your own problem. Like there's like, to me, boots on the ground learning is so much more valuable than, than books. And so I a hundred percent agree because I would always say this as well, that there was a moment in time for me where, you know, I, you're just like tied down to a role and yeah. Okay. That, that puts food on the table and that sort of thing. And it brings money in. Um, but you think about that differently, but then when you put in the position of, I've got to go and build everything myself. So when I went solo, that's just the pressure in keeping everything up is so much higher. Yep. So you have to think, oh, I've got to do this. So I ended up diving into building the WordPress site by myself, right? Like just finding the best way to do it, right? Learning SEO and things, but then doing all of that just by myself. And so I always say that that experience, I can't trade that in for anything. And I always say like, hey, I learned in three months by myself what I'd like more than what I learned in two years within just a company, right? So like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that you have to be going solo to do this, but there's an element of, I think everyone should be keeping an education mindset on education first. When I say that you should be willing to learn by failing and actually go in and trying to execute, right. And try these different things out and trying to build experience for yourself rather than, oh, I'm just going to dive into a book and then I'm going to see if I can rely on a bunch of resources to execute on it. And then that's it. I only have the theoretical knowledge behind this, but not anything practical and successful behind it. But yeah, no, I, I think because if you look at it now, like one of the biggest things missing in the world is like people that uh, have like trade type careers and things like that. And, and those are valuable things that we put so much emphasis on like, you know, college and degrees and things like that. And they just, to me, they just don't have the value of somebody that can roll up their sleeves and, and show you how to exactly. do it. Um, this has been great, but like there's, what I usually do, because we're going to probably be wrapping up soon, 
but is everything yeah. i always go for the everything in retrospect type of like point final point right so is there anything yeah. you would do differently in the beginning or you wish you had known then that you do know that you do know now to help with the entire process i know you mentioned that there was there was just aspects of like for example where you had like a failed podcast that sort of thing so anything at all for the audience that you feel would be like a some advice i guess well here's the thing i would say in terms of like life experience like i had to live some life to be able to do what i can do now you know what i mean i i think it's just that's important but i think the biggest biggest misunderstanding out there is that you can do it without paying for it and you know you want to grow you got to figure out how you're going to pay for your ads you want to do a lot of things um you got to pay for it like if you want to grow a podcast now you got to figure out how to pay for it so to me if i had realized sooner that i need to figure out how to get a budget and how to put money into things we would have grown faster right. I, but i think so many people are trying to do it for free or do it easy or not really invest or whatever it is you just need to be okay with you're gonna have to invest to grow and you just need to figure out who the best person to invest with is that frankly that's what i would have looked at i think that's very very key point a very key point and i've actually had a realization as well about it and it was more so hey neil i don't have to do this for free and i don't have to do this always by myself and i've started to for example simple yeah. things like i was editing everything myself but now i've got like a team member that can help me with that and it's so much mm -hmm. better because the creative thought that goes behind them in doing a few things you know they'll probably bring something to me and or, or i might run an idea and they'll have the next best idea after that right but it there's so much value that you get in return when you've actually put, even if it's a little bit of money into the actual process. But yeah, there we have it, everyone. You know, if you're looking to grow your business yourself, uh, you should really be implementing some of the things that we were talking about today. Um, yeah, give Neil all your money, guys. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, take that, take that statement with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Maybe you should be <laughs> getting on a podcast with uh, Jeremy. That's what we need to be doing. Um, no, honestly, though, but if you're in the exact same, it doesn't matter if you're not in the same exact industry. You know, it's important to just make a few adjustments, but really think about the strategic point that you're in uh, and what you can actually do for your particular industry or vertical, right? And it's as, as I always say, and as we always say here on Growth Vertical, it's always about testing those different strategies and the tactics that serve that, but really understanding what position in what position you're at now and what serves you at that very moment. So thanks for coming, Jeremy. I understand you have a book that you that you mentioned earlier, The Unremarkable yeah. to Extraordinary, right? Um, yeah. Where can where can people like what is it about quickly? You know, like uh, maybe people, everyone can like sort of go and check the book out, right? I know I will. It's based on a lot of what we were talking about today, man. It's about, you know, the importance in self-education. It's, uh, it's, it's about, you know, what you can learn from adversity. It's based on the, you know, oh, nearly a thousand interviews I've done with, you know, incredible people like, you know, a four-time Indy 500 champion, a former CIA director, Hall of Fame athletes. Yeah. Um, I think we're all essentially, you know, we're unremarkable, but it's the things we do that make us extraordinary. Um, and that's, you know, why I put this book together, because I feel like there's so much learning people can do on, you know, how you can create a life on your terms. So if they want to get that, they can head over to getextraordinarybook.com. And we, we put together a great offer for everyone that if you come over and either order or pre-order the book there, we're going to give you a free version of the audio book. If you come back with your, your receipt or your order cut number, as well as our program, 30 Days to Extraordinary. So that's getextraordinarybook.com. Awesome. I'll also put it in the description as well. So it's a little bit easier for everyone to just link to and, and follow exactly what Jeremy just said. But otherwise, it's been amazing, insightful. And I guess I messed this out, Jeremy. Where, where can people, if they have any questions, where can they connect with you? So they can just shoot me an email, man. I am Jeremy at commandyourbrand.com and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to chat with people. Awesome. Well, I hope everyone can take, you know, some acts, some things away from this chat. Uh, there's some really actionable insights here. So yeah, I appreciate this, Jeremy. And uh, everyone, if you like today's episode, then please be sure to like follow, subscribe, uh, share so that we can get this sort of mess, amplify this message and get it out there uh, so it can help others as well. Um, and be sure to hit the like button, right? Depending on what platform, what platform you're on. And obviously uh, reach out and comment if you have, if you want to see any particular content in the future. But anyway, thanks Jeremy once again, and we'll see everyone soon. Take it easy.